Hello and welcome to the new series, Conversations at the Intersection of Cutting Edge Science and Spirituality with Dr. Deepak Chopra, Jennifer Hill Hosting, and Professor Don Hoffman. I'm Amanda Masters, co-founder, owner, and CEO of Awake TV Network. I invite you to check out awaketvnetwork.live where we host many videos and documentaries on science and spirituality, health and wellness, and many other modalities here to support you during these times. Enjoy the episode. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for tuning into Awake TV Network. I'm your host, Jennifer Hill, and I am so happy to have you here with us today for part two of Solving the Hard Problem of Consciousness with two very special guests who joined us here on the show back in January of this year, and that is Professor Don Hoffman and Dr. Deepak Chopra. Don Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at UC Irvine, and he has written over 120 scientific papers. Additionally, he also wrote a recent book called A Case Against Reality, which we found out right before this episode that has been listed, let me check my notes here, Don, shortlisted in the Physics World Book of the Year for 2019, which is a huge yeah. accomplishment. So congratulations to you on that, Don. And then Dr. Deepak Chopra is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, as well as Chopra, Chopra Global. He is interested in the intersection of science and spirituality and is a pioneer in this area. In fact, I believe it was Time Magazine who called Deepak one of the hundred heroes and icons of our time. And it's just so much fun to get to be here with both of you and Deepak. I know you just released your 90th book, Metahuman, which we're of course going to talk about today. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think your 91st book is due to come out in September, October, right? Yes, um, it's called Total Meditation. It's about uh, how to experience reality, not as a sensation, but as the awareness of the sensation. So we can talk about that later. But right now, uh, let's focus on what we're going to be discussing today. Perfect. So today's topic is obviously it's focused on solving this hard problem of consciousness. And for those of you that might be tuning in for the first time, and you may have missed the first episode, in the first episode, we really dived deep into the conversation of what is consciousness. In fact, if I recall correctly, I think we left that episode off on could AI be conscious? So little teaser there, you may have to go back and watch that episode to find out what uh, Deepak and Don had to say about that. And I thought for today's episode, given the state of what's been happening over the last three or four months since we last had the pleasure of joining with one another, I thought this might be an interesting time to talk about the collective consciousness from two different perspectives. Don is coming from a scientific cognitive background and Deepak is coming from a scientific background, but also with a little bit of a spiritual undertone. So Don, I'm gonna throw it to you first. And I would love to first know, what are your thoughts on the collective consciousness and whether there is such a thing as collective or global consciousness? Well, from a, an intuitive perspective, most of us um, don't actually see any collective consciousness, right? We, we see ourselves, we see our families, we see social groups, and we just see them as collections of people. But the idea that there could actually be new levels of consciousness that emerge from the interactions of people is a very, very fascinating idea. In the work that I'm doing on a mathematical model of consciousness, the mathematics um, surprised me by telling me that that's possible, right? I did not go into this with that as a goal, it, but it came out of the mathematics. And so, so the mathematics tells me whenever we have interacting consciousnesses that have certain kind of coherence in their interaction, then new forms of consciousness emerge ad infinitum. So, so despite my personal lack of seeing it, and despite my not intending it, that's where the mathematics is taking me. And so I, you know, have to take that idea very, very seriously. So, so yes, um, I'm, I think so. And, and I think that we do have tools to begin to ask 
mathematically and precisely how does that happen and what kinds of conscious consciousness might emerge. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Don. And, and Deepak, I would love to know your insights or thoughts on could there be a thing such as global consciousness or a noosphere, even perhaps, as a famous philosopher once said. So, called? you know, I'm really thrilled that uh, Don is moving in that direction from a mathematical and scientific perspective. And what he just said was very interesting to me that the interaction of several conscious agents. Uh, could result in something called collective consciousness. Yeah, am I correct in how you said mm -hmm. you said that? Okay, so I want to give you a little different perspective, which might actually correlate with uh, Don's perspective. So, in the spiritual traditions of the East, particularly Vedanta and Buddhism, which are not based on objective. Uh, methodologies uh, that science has, like experimentary validation or falsification. Um, these philosophies emerge from um, what we can call um, awareness of experience, both uh, perceptual experience and mental experience. And so when we look at these philosophies, which are coming from the purely um, experiential meditative insight. Mm -hmm. This is what we are told. We are told that, uh, or we also experience, that consciousness is not a personal property mm. of a biological organism. Um, just like, you know, you think your personal, you know, your hair, the color of your hair, or the skin tone, or your eyes, or your facial expression, you can claim is yours. Mm -hmm. But you cannot claim that consciousness belongs to you. You can claim that the conditioned mind, which is a product of consciousness, mm -hmm. belongs to you. But consciousness by itself is not a material thing. You can't see it. Although without it, you can't experience what we call seeing. Consciousness is the activity that results in one modality of knowing called seeing or hearing or tasting or smelling or feeling or whatever experience you have. So there's a fundamental distinction between existence as awareness of existence. So existence is defined as awareness of existence, which is the same thing as consciousness of existence, which in these spiritual traditions is the knowing of I am, not I am Deepak Chopra or I am observing that object, just that I'm aware that I exist. That's called consciousness. Now, conscious activity is mental and perceptual. So it's the conscious activity results in what we call sensation, sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts, and then selective identification with that produces an individual conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Now, this consciousness, which is a causal without cause, mm. which is formless, because you can't see it, it has no form, you can't sense it through the senses, although it is responsible for every sensation that you have, it's formless, it's without cause, it's therefore irreducible. And it is not in space or time. It, even space time are experiences in this consciousness, and which is the knowing element in every experience in every species. So, you know, uh, biological organisms like the human biological organism is a mode of experience as also an experience. So mm -hmm. you, how do you know you have a body? Well, because you're aware of it. And how are you aware of it? Because you sense it. How do you sense it? You perceive it like you perceive any other object. Hmm. The only difference is you can consciously move this object that you call biological organism, but you can't with your thoughts move another object, which is this. So we call this inanimate, we call this animate, but they're all modalities of knowing and modes of knowing. So there is experience which Fundamentally, it's a sensation. It's a modulation of consciousness into a sensation 
that says there's me and there's the other. Me being this organism and the other being either an object or maybe another animate object, which we call a biological organism. So there's awareness of existence, which is prior to experience, which is a sensation. So in this model, that actually in a way supports uh, Don's model, consciousness is a result of not only the interaction of individual conscious agents, but it is also what differentiates into individual conscious agents. So they're complementarities, mm -hmm. just like, you know, organism and environment are complementarities, mind and body are complementarities, etc. The undifferentiated consciousness is pure consciousness, therefore universal consciousness. It differentiates into collective and ultimately individual consciousness, which is both culture specific and species specific, because you don't have the same experience as an insect with a hundred eyes or a dolphin or whatever other organism. These are all different modes of knowing, therefore different knowers and different things known all within one undifferentiated consciousness prior to experience. As soon as experience happens, it differentiates into modes of knowing and experience which are biological organisms. So biological organism is actually not having the experience. It is an experience that is unified with every other experience in awareness, which is without location in space or time. That's the spiritual point of view. But I, I can see the correlates. Well, and, and I completely agree, actually, Deepak. The, um, the interesting thing is, as a scientist, I started, you know, like with elementary agents and try to build up, right? That's sort of what scientists Correct. try to do. But Absolutely. when I did that, then when I looked at the mathematical structure, I realized that equally you can start from the top and go down and it's all the same thing. And so there, so even though the way I came at it was showing how agents combine to create new agents, when I realized there's one agent and that one agent is constantly self-exploring and growing and each one of the little agents then is as much influenced by the whole as it is influencing the whole. And so, so that, well, then this is complementarity because top down and bottom up lead to the same conclusion. Yes, exactly right. And I know we were emailing about this a few days ago, guys. Uh, we were talking about this idea of the holographic universe. And that was actually what had me call you, Deepak, that one day back on March, whenever it was before the pandemic really hit hard. And we decided to do that global coherence meditation, what's now become the Coalition for Global Unity. And I remember reading in one of, I believe it was Greg Braden's books called Divine Matrix, where he says, what if we all live in this holographic universe? And I think I was mentioning to you both that I just started a new book on that. And it sounds similar to both of your principles, both scientifically and spiritually, that people are coming to the same conclusion that for, for those people who might not be familiar with the concept of a holograph, if, for example, I think the example they use is the uh, Princess Leia holograph, you know, imagine one of those bookmarks that you might have had in the 1980s or 90s. If you slice that up into a hundred little pieces on each single piece would be the entire hologram itself. And a lot of the stuff I've been reading about lately, and I think a lot of what's in alignment with each of your books and philosophies is that you are saying there is a one whole. Don, you were just saying something to that effect and Deepak came to the same conclusion. Can both of you, uh, let's start maybe with um, Deepak this time, on your ideas on whether or not there is a possibility of a holographic universe, and if so, how does consciousness fit into that? So, you know, holography is, of course, a technology, and it gives us a lot of perspectives in that uh, um, you might see the same object um, that I'm seeing, but you're seeing it from a different perceptual window. Mm. So even right now in this room, I'm experiencing this room and you through a particular perceptual window, and everybody else who's watching us is experiencing the same thing from a different perceptual window. But even in this room, I could be experiencing this room from different perceptual windows and it's still the same room. Okay, so I would like to phrase, rephrase what you said, recognizing the holographic model as 
all experiences entangled with every other experience. Makes sense. And in fact, it's the same experience being perceived differently by uh, the human species also as individuals, but also by other species. They're actually experiencing the same consciousness from a different perceptual window, which is species specific and therefore, and in humans also culture specific based on the narratives we've told ourselves since the beginning of our, uh, our capacity for telling stories. So in the earlier stories were mythical stories and religious stories and philosophical stories and theological stories. Right now we have a scientific story, which is a modeling again of experience. So when we understand that uh, experience is entangled, then that's very consistent with what you're saying is the holographic universe. There's one reality being experienced in different modes of knowing, perception, mentation, and interpretation. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much, Deepak. And Don, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. The yeah, I, I agree with that, that those ideas, Deepak. In, in, in physics, when they talk about the holographic principle, many physicists are thinking about some work largely inspired by the work of Juan Maldacena, where he showed that um, a quantum field theory and a theory of gravity can be seen as the same thing. But the, the, the theory of gravity is in a space of one higher dimension than the quantum field theory. And, and, and so it, our space time that we're perceiving as a three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, but if you, you know, do super string theory, maybe it's you know, 10 or 11 dimensions. But the idea is that what we're experiencing as a world with this extra dimension in gravity is equivalent to a world without gravity uh, on a space of one lower dimension. And so physicists are trying to understand what clue this is giving us about the nature of the world we live in. It, I mean, we, it first came up in the study of black holes where they realized that the amount of information that is contained in a black hole doesn't depend on the volume of the black hole. It only depends on the area. And if you think about that for a minute, that will blow your mind, right? But the, and, and, and then they realize that that's true, not just for black holes, but it's true for any region of space. Hmm. The amount of information that you can stick inside a volleyball does not depend on the volume of the volleyball. It only depends on the surface area. And once you begin to think deeply about that, everything that you believe about space-time is going to start to dissolve and you're gonna go crazy because how could it be that the amount of information you could stick into a region of space doesn't depend on the volume of the space? What, what kind of thing is space and time? And so the holographic principle really gets at a big watershed in science. Hmm. The watershed is this, for the last several centuries, Science has been fundamentally assuming that space-time, mm. first space and time separately, like since Newton and even before, that space and time are fundamental. That's the ultimate nature of reality. Since Einstein, space-time, the union of space and time together into space-time is the fundamental reality. But now with the holographic principle and some other things that have happened in science in the last few decades, scientists are beginning to realize that that foundation, which has been there for centuries, is now at risk. In fact, it's over. Space-time is doomed, and there's got to be some new foundation. So this is one of the biggest moments in the history of science, but, but scientists don't know yet what to put as deeper than space-time. Something is deeper, and from it, space-time emerges. So that's where the holographic principle and, and, and what you and I are talking about is maybe, maybe a theory of consciousness is what we need to go deeper with. Now, that's of course a step where the scientists, my, my you know, the, my colleagues aren't going there yet, right? But but that's what if we could do it mathematically and get it precise, then perhaps we can bring them along. So we have to have a mathematical model of consciousness show how space time emerges holographically um, as a projection, and then 
predict specific things like scattering amplitudes of gluon interactions at the Large Hadron Collider. If we can do that, then we'll be taken seriously. <laughs> so this is very exciting, Don, because I'll tell you where this is leading from a spiritual perspective or from the wisdom traditions. And, uh, you know, this is one of the biggest problems in science today. And this is Einstein's quest, right? How to unify gravity with what we know of quantum field theory. And he was never able to do it. Mm -hmm. And nor is any other scientist do it. So if you come from a consciousness perspective, actually there's no contradiction at all. So uh, space, time and gravity are a different mode of knowing than quantum field theory, which is a different mode of knowing. It depends on the methodology you use for the experience that you call knowing. So when you use uh, knowing on a big scale, you experience space, time, and gravity. When you experience knowing on a micro uh, scale or your ob observation, it's all a question of how you observe, basically. One is you're observing macro and your experience space, time, gravity, et cetera. And the other is your mode of knowing is very microscopic or even ultra microscopic. And then, of course, you experience what we, or you derive quantum field theory. But they're actually representative of different modes of knowing in the same human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And they're therefore different uh, uh, expressions of modalities of knowing. So before I can say this is gravity, I have to have an experience. The experience as a qualia experience is heaviness. That's it. Once I then, uh, from there, I derive everything else. So first experience is always a sensation, whether it's a uh, uh, sensation that we call hearing or tasting or smelling or touching or thinking. Thinking is a sensation or feeling or imagination. It's a subtle sensation. So in the wisdom traditions, there are gross sensations, perceptual expressions, which are actually all derived from the sensation of touch. So, you know, the skin being the largest organ derived from the neuroectoderm, um, uh, it kind of involutes on its own self, the skin, and then appears as the sensation of hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling. But these are sensations in the one consciousness. And essentially, they are modes of knowing. And, you know, the, if one should understand this, you also understand what people call synesthesia and different ad, uh, other uh, experiences in uh, other species. If you start from this, level and then what you do is everything else is a story it's a derivative mm -hmm. a human story a human model of that experience and that experience so before i call, can call something an object whatever that object is hand or etc i experience it now i reify that experience as the objects of experience out there when in fact the sensation was derived from consciousness. The sensation was a modulation of consciousness, and that's how we define consciousness. It's the knowing element of every experience, so every experience is made out of consciousness. It is known in consciousness. It arises in consciousness. It dissipates in consciousness. The only thing that gives continuity to the, to the experience is actually the presence of awareness. So every experience is almost like a snapshot. I look at you, I look there, that's a different snapshot. I hear this, I hear that, that's a different snapshot. In the seeing, in the very act of seeing, is the creation of both the seer and the scenery. So the seer and the scenery are byproducts with every snapshot of seeing. And by seeing, I'm using the whole perceptual experience. Seer and scene are not, seer and scenery are not fundamental at all. It's the act of seeing, which is consciousness modulating itself as that particular activity. So the continuity that we get, the movie that we see as experience is actually the presence of awareness between the snapshots of experience and in the snapshots of experience, both. You know, so once you realize that consciousness awareness is 
fundamentally even prior to any sensation, then gravity, space-time, quantum field theories, all these are derivatives of modes of knowing and experience. So exactly what you said. There's no, no contradiction between gravity, space-time theories and quantum field if we agree that there are different modes of knowing and experience. Yeah. May I say something on that, please, Jennifer? Please, yes, please, yes, please, please. So, it's very important yeah, I, I hear your point of view. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with that, that idea. So um, space-time itself is merely a form of our experiences. So scientists have assumed that space-time is this fundamental thing that was created at the Big Bang, and it's this pre-existing stage. And life didn't come along until hundreds of millions of years later, and consciousness even later than that. And so consciousness is just this latecomer. The, the, the pre-existing stage of space-time is the fundamental thing. We're turning that around. And I think science, this is the big watershed in science. We're turning that around. Instead of space-time being the fundamental pre-existing reality, space-time is merely a data structure that consciousness uses to understand itself. Now, of course, scientists aren't, that last sentence is not what scientists are saying, right? They're saying that there's something beyond space-time. Space-time is not fundamental. They're finding deeper structures. Um, Nima Arkani Hamed at, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton is finding the amplitude hedron and other very interesting structures that are deeper than space-time that have symmetries that can't be expressed in space-time and yet lead to neat predictions like scattering amplitudes at the Large Hadron Collider in space-time. So, so this is the big watershed. Consciousness is fundamental. Again, this is not what the scientists, what, what, what the scientists are saying is space-time has been assumed to be fundamental. Now space-time is doomed. There's something more fundamental. That's what the scientists are saying. I, I need to separate what they're saying from what I'm suggesting. <laughs> what, what I'm suggesting is that if we have a mathematical model of consciousness, we can actually show that, as you said, Deepak, that in, in some sense, it's the action of consciousness experiencing itself in its own dynamics that is using an interface of space-time as the data format. It's much like if you're trying to visualize a vast social network. It's, it, it, it's overwhelming, for example, to visualize the whole Twitterverse. There's tens of millions of users, billions of tweets. How are you going to visualize all these consciousnesses interacting? Will you use a simple visualization tool? to project. So you, you might have like a virtual reality headset that you put on and you, you, you know, see what's trending in New York versus mm -hmm. London and so forth as little graphical objects moving around in colors and so forth and doing various things. That's how you see what's trending in New York versus London and so forth. But what we've done is we've mistaken our little headset, which is just a visualization tool for the vast social network, which is the thing that we were really interested in. And so consciousness is this vast social network, which is a network, but it's also one thing. And we're using, as members of this network, we're using a little headset of space-time as a visualization tool to understand our interactions in the network. And so, so that's the, now, as a scientist, of course, I'm waving my hands, right? We have to turn the, what I just said, which is hand-wavy, into precise mathematics. What precisely is the mathematical model of the network of conscious agents and its dynamics, how precisely does that map into a space-time interface? And, and once we get that, by the way, some of the things you were saying about what are objects, it turns out that objects will just be things that are invariant under symmetries of our interface. So what, what, is, um, what is a, you know, some little object like, like this? Well, it's, it's the same thing if I translate it so that's a symmetry of space, translation. It's the same thing if I rotate it. That's another symmetry of space-time. So essentially, space-time gives us the format of all the symmetries, what they call the Poincaré group of symmetries. And, and objects are what they call re representations, irreducible representations of those symmetries. That's what objects are. So we have this data format of space-time. We've got the symmetries called the Poincaré group. And even particles, like gluons, are irreducible representations of this group but so are everyday objects. They're, they're things that are invariant under the action of that group. So, so ultimately what we want to do is, is have a mathematical model of consciousness, the dynamics of conscious interactions, show how that projects nicely into a space-time interface. Once we do that, it's going to open up 
brand new technologies because if space time isn't fundamental and we understand what is, then we will be able to play with the parameters of space time itself. It's going to open up a Pandora's box of technologies. Wow, 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 wow. So I'm getting a very close insight right now on the differences and the commonalities between what we call science and spirituality. So let me uh, share with you what that insight is and I, I would love for you to comment. So science is always asking um, about what's going on, you know, what's going on. And the basic questions about science are what, when, how. But spirituality asks another question. And that question is why and who is asking the question or what is asking the question. Now, science gives us a very good mathematical methodology to answer when, how, what, but it doesn't actually tell us why or what is asking the question. Now, spirituality says those are very difficult questions and um, when you say why, that's actually almost an impossible question to answer. <laughs> impossible, other than it is the play of consciousness to no experience, period. But otherwise, there's no question to the answer why. Okay, and to whom or what? What is asking the question? Of course, consciousness is asking the question in order to understand its own experiences. So, you know, there is a confluence here between cutting edge science, as you explain it, and spirituality as why and who or what is asking that question. And the answers are still mysterious. It's the play of consciousness and consciousness is asking the question, but it does bring now consciousness and science together in our modes of knowing and experiencing, in our modes of knowing and experiencing. And when we create new technologies, which you said are going to emerge, all we are doing is expanding our modes of knowing and experience. Right now we are doing that, you know, right now, this is an extra sensory experience. You know, what we're having right now is in a way we are sharing what we call cyberspace, but we are also sharing cognitive space. We are also sharing perceptual space. And that space has no location. Uh, that, that even, it has no, it has no um, existence in time as well, because space and time go together. Space is a way of measuring time. Time is a way of measuring space. So all of this conversation is, having, uh, is actually happening non-locally. We are only interpreting it as local. You know, the experience of your body as a conglomeration of qualia, collection of qualia, is a non-local experience. You can't identify a qualia experience, the color red, as having this location or that location, or this feeling as having this location or that location. So actually everything is happening non-locally. Non it is just our interpretation that gives us a local experience. Uh, Deepak, can I share one thing that was actually, I think, out of your book on that, Deepak, that, and it ties into what Don said, if I may interrupt this <laughs> incredible. Yeah, but I'd like to hear Don's response after you share your insight. Please yeah, ab absolutely. It ties into both. What, what occurred to me is, as I was reviewing the notes from both of your books, I think it was in your book, Deepak, where you talked about Heisenberg, the German physicist, who said, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to a method of questioning. In other words, you see a tree because you are asking to see a tree. And that just made me think of, Don, what you shared about the virtual reality example is what if we're walking around in this virtual reality, you gave the example of the Twitterverse, and every question we ask gives us access to new realities and new consciousness, but it takes the asking of that question to have access to that new realm, new technology or otherwise. Does Before make... Don answers, may I just um, kind Please. of refine the statement of Heisenberg? By Please, you I, I thought I got it right, but I might have gotten it wrong. <laughs> no, no, you got it right. You quoted Heisenberg exactly right, and you quoted me quoting Heisenberg <laughs> exactly right. But actually, it's not the fundamental truth. We don't ask nature the question. We ask ourselves the question. Uh -huh. And then we give attribution to something that we call nature. 
Thank but you. anyway, I want um, uh, Don to uh, respond to both your question and what I was saying. Right. So you're absolutely right that, that scientists typically think that the question of why is beyond the can of science, right? The standard view is that there are these laws. And mm -hmm. what we do is discover the laws. And once we write down the laws, then we can make predictions about what's going to happen and, and extrapolate. But the question of why for many scientists is something that is out, out of bounds. And I think that that's not necessary for science to be limited away from the why questions. I think mm -hmm. if you take a physicalist framework and it's just essentially a machine, a probabilistic machine, but a machine, um, then in some sense, you, you have already answered the why question. There, there is no purpose, it, it's a machine. And, and, and so there, the answer is, there is no why, it just is. Uh, but when you start to let go of space time now, and you start to let go of physicalism, and you start to think out of that box, um, then it opens up new, pers new perspectives that science can address, right? Science, by the way, is not the same thing as physicalism. Mm -hmm. Many people think that science and physicalism, belief in space-time being fundamental and, and impersonal laws being fundamental, probabilistic, that's not what science is. That's a particular theory, and science is a methodology that can dismiss that theory. It used that theory very successfully for centuries, and it can equally well find its limitations and dismiss it and look for a deeper theory. So, and with that deeper theory may, be, may come a different answer to the question of why. In my study of consciousness as a scientist, I've only found one idea that seems deep enough to be a candidate for the why, and it aligns precisely with what you're saying. Hmm. So, so the idea is this, it comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem, hmm. right? Gödel, it's a technical theorem, but in, intuitively what it means, and, and by the way, I'm not stating the theorem, I'm just stating what it means for me. The theorem basically says no matter how much structure, mathematical structure you explore, you haven't begun. Hmm. It's, it's unbounded and it's endless. And from the point of view in which consciousness is all there is, then mathematical structure is only about consciousness. All structure is the structure of consciousness. So Gödel's theorem in that context means that there's an unbounded exploration of the forms of consciousness, which is what you were saying. It's an unbounded exploration. It's a theorem that in principle, consciousness itself can never come to the end of the exploration. That's the theorem. That's what Gödel is telling us. So that means that, I mean, I'm not saying that this is right, but it's the only idea that I found that's deep enough to be worth considering seriously. And that is that based on Gödel's theorem, there's this, what I would call Gödel's candy store, this infinite candy store of possible forms of conscious exploration and experiences. And that's what consciousness is up to. It's, it's self-understanding, self-exploration, and Gödel's theorem tells us the why. The why is, in principle, it can never be done, in principle. And so that's what, that would be the, the why. And so it's always about asking new questions, as you were saying, putting new, the Heisenberg thing that you, that you brought up, Jennifer, it's, it, it's literally, and that's what we're doing as scientists. We're part of this exploration of consciousness. We're putting new questions out there, and we're realizing that the old frameworks that we had, like space-time was fundamental, that was, a, you know, it was useful, it gave us lots of technology, and it's deeply flawed. Time to move on to the next thing that shows how space-time model is a special case of a more general model. We don't just throw away our previous work. We, whatever new model we come up with, it better project into space-time and give us back the science that we already have, or generalizations of that science. So, so the science that we've done in space-time constrains are deeper models. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a nice progression that way. So here's how I think science and spirituality can go back and forth, right? We can take the big ideas of spirituality, use the rigorous hard-nosed methods of science and have this back and forth dance that makes us ask the right questions and come to rigorous answers.
That's absolutely brilliant, Don. And I wanted to ask you a question which may or may not be answerable uh, in view of what you've just said. Gödel's theorem, which basically says there are um, there are uh, uh, there are theorems that cannot be proved logically by other theorems, uh, but once you accept them, then it opens new possibilities. Uh, is that a good uh, translation of your interpretation of uh, Gödel's theorem? Um, close. In it, it, it's it's. We, we do want to be careful about Gödel's theorem. So, so right. it, it's basically saying that, but the, the, more, more technically, it's any axiomatic system that's powerful enough to do arithmetic. There will be statements that are true in that system that cannot be proved. That's it. Okay. No. That, that's the more technical thing. And, and but then, if you add the new true, the, add those new truths as theorems to the system and get a bigger system. There'll be yet more truths that can't be provable in the bigger system. And, and what Gödel is showing is that no matter how many truths you add to your system, there will always be truths beyond. And this goes on forever. And so there's endless mathematical structure to explore. And that means that consciousness, if, if consciousness is fundamental and all mathematical structure is only therefore about consciousness, that means consciousness has an endless candy store of possibilities of consciousness to explore. Well, I love that. Does it ultimately lead us to answer the why of why is there existence and why is there awareness of existence? Because in my tradition, they're the same thing. Existence and awareness of existence are synonymous because, um, because if you weren't aware of existence, then for practical matter, it, there's no existence. So why does, is there existence and why is there awareness of existence? Mm -hmm. And actually, the answer that comes from spiritual traditions is that even explanation is a human construct, that ultimately there is no explanation. Right. And, and the, the counterpoint to that point that you just made, which I think is good, the counterpoint in science is that every scientific theory must have assumptions. And it might sound like I'm not saying the same thing, but I'm saying exactly this. Those assumptions for every theory are the miracles for the theory. Every scientific theory has its miracles. Those are, we, we call them the assumptions, but, but let's call them what they are. For that theory, they are miracles. We, we asked, please grant me these assumptions. Just grant them by fiat. And if you grant me these, like space and time are fundamental, you know, Einstein's equations and quantum field equations, grant me those, then I can explain all this other stuff. Um, where did those assumptions come from? Well, I don't know. I mean, those are the miracles of my theory. Now, you, you can say, well, okay, I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to get a theory in which space time isn't fundamental, maybe quantum bits and quantum gates or something like that. That's great, then now space-time isn't a miracle, but now you've got a new miracle. It's the quantum bits and the quantum gates. And that's the point. Scientific explanations can never be total. There is no scientific theory of everything. There's a scientific theory of everything if you grant me these assumptions, which are outside of my theory. They're the foundation of my theory. And so science is saying the same thing that you're saying, explanation necessarily stops. Now, the thing is, it doesn't have to stop here, like in space-time. It doesn't have to stop there at quantum bits and gates. There's an endless regress, perhaps, that we can go after as scientists. It's good for job security for a scientist. I mean, this is what I'm all for it, right? But that means that we can be constantly looking for deeper and deeper and deeper sets of assumptions, deeper miracles, but, but science will never be rid of miracles. And that's what you're saying when you say that at some point, explanation stops. Well, I'm sure um, Jennifer has a question, <laughs> but I'm suggesting um, a series of conversations we can do with uh, Jennifer's help, and we can actually create a whole series called uh, Cutting Edge uh, Science, or Conversations at the Edge of Cutting Edge Science and Spirituality, if you like that idea, yes. because then we can not only address the hard problem, but all these conundrums, you know, it's not just a hard problem, the conundrum of gravity and quantum field theories, uh, and Gödel's theorem. I mean, these lead to endless explorations 
which will not only improve what uh, you just said, will give us new technologies. That, that's amazing. Just the fact, new technologies to explore our modes of knowing and experience. But I think answering some of uh, Jennifer's questions too right now that she posed before we got on is, you know, how do we now, given what we learned in, in these conversations, how do we look at what's happening in the world right now, which is conflict, which is war, terrorism, eco-destruction, climate change, pandemics, social injustice, racial injustice. I mean, these are real life experiences that are happening now. Does our deeper understanding or even this conversation where it's going on what is reality and yes. what is cutting edge science, where is it showing, leading us? and what is traditional exploration of awareness as understood in wisdom traditions or spirituality. They're not dogmas, they're not, there are no dogmas in this, there's no ideology. It's an exploration. It's an exploration of both experience and exploration of the why of experience and the how of experience. So if, you, if you're kind of a, a sympathetic to that idea, I think we should actually continue um, we might be running out of time before Jennifer asks the last question, but this deeper uh, conversation about where is cutting edge science going, uh, going and what are the insights that come from self-awareness, which is what ultimately spirituality can be defined just as that one word, self-awareness and awareness of experience in the self. Where does this conversation take us? Not only in the world of technology, which is just wonderful, but solving these issues of experience that are actually um, suggesting that we might be headed to extinction because we're not seeing the big picture. We're just seeing, you know, in terms of race or in economics or, uh, or the pandemic, we are actually not seeing the entanglement of all experience. Well, Deepak, I think you just hit on something really powerful. And so, yes, I think it's a wonderful idea, first and foremost, that we continue these conversations because it's only through dialogue that we can begin to have the consciousness and the awareness to understand one another. And as for how this relates to the greater world at large and to everything from the pandemic to the riots and what's happening in the world right now, I think what we can all take away from this is the ability to be curious and ask questions. It's funny, Don, when you just talked about the assumptions in science or the miracles, I think the assumptions in the real world, and the well, real world would be objective anyways, given this conversation, but the questions that we ask of one another, it's through a process and engaging in inquiry, much like we've engaged in today, that we can begin to find solutions, whether it's solutions to the pandemic, solutions to the issues of racism, lack of unity, but we'll never get there unless we first ask the questions. So the last question I would love to leave you both with before we continue this into the next uh, part as Deepak so kindly referenced is the question is what question hasn't yet been asked about consciousness that could lead to the next big discovery? Don? Hmm. Wow. Well, th there's several questions to be asked, but if I had to pick one, I, I would say the, the, the one question that I'm working on right now, that I focus on because I think it's at this point, the, the crux of how to get consciousness in modern science talking, not at cross purposes, but, but actually starting to work together is the specific technical thing. How precisely do consciousnesses use space-time as their interface to rep at least certain consciousnesses how do they use space-time as their interface to to compress the complicated so consciousness is complicated it's got this fantastic dynamics space-time is this it, it seems complicated to us but compared to that dynamics it's drop dead stupidly simple right space-time is really simple it's a it's a dumbed down user interface i want to understand how consciousness projects itself into that little interface. Mm. That's the specific, it's a technical, when, when I'm done, I will have a mathematically precise formula for how that projection goes. 
once we have that formula, that's when the technology starts to come. So that for me is, it's not maybe the, the, the end all and be all question, but it's the next question for me that I want to pursue. That, that might be the next question or the first question, the next show in the series that we do. And Deepak, I know you have a time constraint as well and I want to honor that. So if you have any closing- well, No, we can, uh, we can uh, incorporate everything that Don said and also into what the Buddha had as his insight. He said the only reason to understand consciousness is the elimination of suffering. Mm. And he says the reason we suffer, first of all, this is the four noble truths. One is there is suffering. He didn't say life is suffering, which is often quoted mm. as he said there's suffering, just like there's joy and there's pleasure and there's pain. There is suffering. It's a fact of life. That's the first noble truth. The second noble truth is the causes of suffering can be identified. And when he goes into those causes of suffering, he says, you're seeing reality through a fragmented, conditioned mm -hmm. mind, and that is the cause of suffering. That's the second noble truth. The third noble truth is there's a way out. <laughs> and the way out is knowing consciousness as fundamental. So now we can do with all that Don has said about space-time interface, this is our interface for experiencing this conversation. But if you go a little deeper, then we can actually relate this to a more holistic worldview that doesn't see the world in fragments and pieces, but actually sees you as consciousness and the world as one. And once you don't know that, that's actually the reason to understand even the cycle of birth, death, all of that is a clue right here that what these constructs, birth, death, suffering, etc., are all coming from a fragmented mind rather than the whole mind, which is conscious. So we can explore this in the future. I love that, Deepak. And I don't know if I actually ever shared this with you, but when you and I, when we did that first uh, global coherence meditation on March 9th, we had played with the idea of inviting the Dalai Lama. And, you know, it wasn't right timing wise to have him participate. But one day I sat down in the midst of that and I meditated. And I do believe that our consciousness is all connected. So I meditated deeply and I asked, I asked his high holiness in meditation. I said, your high holiness, would you honor us with your presence? This is when Carolyn was looking into this for us. And I got a message back from that consciousness or whatever you would call it from a higher consciousness, possibly his saying, consider why you're putting this global coherence meditation on. You're seeing the world as being broken. And until you can see the world as being whole and complete, you won't be doing it coming from the right place. But first you must see yourself as whole and complete to see the world as whole and complete. So I thought that might be a good thing for us to close That's on. That's good. And for both of your information, it's His Holiness's uh, birthday this week. Oh. And so i in touch with the organization. And hopefully, you know, it's its 85th birthday and it's a time for celebration amongst those of us who actually embrace the idea that consciousness is fundamental. So I hope that will happen and it will happen. I Don love that. And and you make oh, well, one of these days. Absolutely. Well, happy birthday to His High Holiness and on His birthday. What day is it, Deepak? And we'll be sure to uh, send Sometime you. around now. I we'll just sent a birthday greeting. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Well, this has been such a pleasure, gentlemen. I am so happy that we were able to do this again. And a huge thanks to Awake TV Network for giving us this forum and the space to have part two of solving the hard problem for consciousness. It is so powerful to engage in this inquiry and to explore the things that we think we know are true from a different perspective. And as Don mentioned so eloquently, noticing that we're wearing this virtual reality headset. And to your point, Deepak, what about realizing that what if we are just all one as the Buddha suggested and how can we get ourselves there to have science and spirituality unite? But more importantly, how can we have us unite with one another, with everything that's happening in the world. Let's find a way to unite our consciousness for the greater good. 
My name is Jennifer Hill. We've had Dr. Deepak Chopra here with us today, Professor Don Hoffman of UC Irvine, and it's been a fun discussion here. I know that you can definitely check out the last episode that we did. It's on Deepak's channel, also on the Awake TV Network website. And do follow all of us. Ask us if you have any questions. Um, Deepak, if people want to follow you, I know you do these amazing daily interactions on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. Where would you recommend people go if they want to find out information about what you're doing? Uh, DeepakChopra.com. Perfect. So DeepakChopra.com. And Don, if people want to find out about a case against reality or find out, I mean, I think it's still amazing that your book has been shortlisted in the Physics World Book of the Year for 2019. So if people want to find out more information about all the amazing things that you're up to or that UC Irvine is up to, where would you recommend that they go? Um, my, my homepage at the University of California. So just if you Google Donald Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, my homepage has links to my, my papers and, and my Twitter account and so forth. Amazing. And I invite you, if you want to find out more about what I'm doing here on the network, you can find other shows that we've done. Roger Nelson will be joining me tomorrow morning on Conversations for Consciousness. Roger Nelson is the founder of the Global Consciousness Project and previously worked at the Pear Institute at Princeton. So we are constantly engaging in these conversations for consciousness, about consciousness, and of consciousness. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Jen Hill, speaker, uh, and find me at Metaphysics. Com. So thank you so much for tuning in today and please do check out all of the amazing other content here on the network. It's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Don. Thank you, Zed. Thank you very much. Thank you.